Today marks the third month of my pregnancy. I've been in and out of the hospital for the past few months and am suffering from a deep, lingering depression. It all started when I climbed Mount San Cristobal. Let's put the Devil's Mountain to the test on this hike, Kyle said. He was president of our hiking club. We met on a mountain and fell in love on a mountain, not knowing it would all end on a mountain. On this hike, we were joined by our close friend Alan. He was a cheeky fellow who enjoyed playing practical jokes on us. However, he was warned not to do so on this expedition. Mount San Cristobal is a potentially active volcano located between the provinces of Laguna and Quezon on Luzon Island and is located beside Mount Banahao, otherwise known as the Sacred Mountain by locals. There have been myths concerning both mountains. One is a source of terror, while the other is a path to salvation. Our van was stopped for inspection. A police officer greeted us with an ominous warning. Mount Cristobal is called the Devil's Mountain for a reason. If I were you, I wouldn't proceed on this journey. He held his hand out to feel the rain. See? It's raining even though the sun is shining. Believe me, I have seen this all before. Alan proceeded to laugh. The officer was visibly irritated. So he explained that three tourists had gone missing while hiking in the mountain just last week. He looked at our travel documents, then returned them, then whispered to us, If you get lost, turn your shirts inside out. The hike hadn't fully started yet, when peculiar things occurred. Hmm? Kyle found a big hairy caterpillar inside his bag when he was getting bug spray. He suspected that Alan put it there, so he reminded him not to joke around. Alan just shrugged <sighs> his shoulders in confusion. As we hiked up the trail, the rainforest on Mount San Cristobal sent chills down my spine with its moss-covered ancient trees and gloomy fog. We stumbled across a terrifying sign hanging on a baleti tree that warned us the region was haunted by spirits and that we must be respectful. <laughs> Alan laughed. He was sure that it had been placed there by locals to frighten visitors and make the mountain more eerie. However, he stopped laughing when he felt something on his neck. I looked at his neck and found several black and brown leeches. These are blood-sucking limatic, he said as he tried to remove and stomp on them. I was concerned about his neck. Some areas appeared bruised. I caught Kyle looking at me as I was applying cream on Alan's neck. I sensed he was becoming jealous, so I teasingly proceeded to lightly stroke our friend's neck. After a few hours, we decided to rest and have dinner. Alan forgot the discomfort and set up his hammock. I went near Kyle as he was setting up our tent. I embraced him from behind, but he immediately turned away. This led Alan to tease us with a song. He suddenly stopped singing when some stones were thrown near our tent. Alan was suspicious. Maybe some locals were playing tricks on us. Kyle tried to find the source of the stones, but didn't find anything. It was dark, so we relied on the campfire. We cooked some food and ate while Alan hung out in his hammock. He wasn't interested in dinner because of the pain in his neck. I stopped chewing when more stones were thrown at us. Kyle instantly glanced around. Alan was still in his hammock, asleep, so it wasn't him. Then, beyond the baleti trees, I spotted a weird shadow. I tried to point it out, but it quickly vanished. Kyle pulled out his Swiss army knife and walked over to the trees. 
Nothing was there. However, I noticed the shadow again. It moved quickly from one tree to the next, along with the sound of thunderous thumps. The noise woke up Alan, and he pulled out his knife. We decided to leave the area. We were certain someone was hiding in the trees. And I felt like someone was following us, since I could still hear faint thuds nearby. After wandering around for a while, we came upon an abandoned hut and went inside. The floor was made of bamboo sticks that squeaked whenever we stepped on it. The leaves on the roof were already loose, allowing us to see the full moon through them. We decided to sleep there for the night. As I was laying down, I saw the shadow again and realized it seemed human, but not quite at the same time. Kyle and Alan didn't see the shadow, but heard the heavy thumps. So we left the hut and looked for help. We traveled for almost an hour and didn't encounter anyone. All we could hear was the sound of crickets, along with the heavy thuds following us. We then arrived at the same abandoned hut and realized we were lost and going around in circles. I remembered what the police officer told us, so I turned my shirt inside out. After I finished, I assisted Kyle. When I turned to Alan, he declined. Alan was breathing heavily. He dropped to his knees, exhausted. Go ahead, I'll catch up later. We should stop here and let Alan rest. No, let him rest here. We'll get help once we reach the base. Go on, I'll be fine. I just need a few minutes. With a sigh of relief, we could now see the nearest town in the distance. And noticed something staring at us. Sure enough, there it was. Sitting beneath a huge baleti tree. A giant, human-like figure with a head of a horse. Its eyes were burning with rage as it stood on its hind legs. It had two abnormally long arms and two long slender legs. Surrounding its body was dark smoke that smelled like sulfur. I could even taste the acidity of the smoke from where I stood. We were petrified. The creature slowly walked towards us. It was gigantic. We were overwhelmed by its presence, certain that we would die. Kyle dropped to the floor as his legs gave out. I was crying, praying to God to help us. The creature laughed at us. It looked at me with its massive, fiery eyes and licked its lips. You will be my wife. It continued laughing. Its voice was thunderous. The creature pointed at Kyle, revealing its razor-sharp claws. You have no use for me. I will kill you later. Try to outrun me. Go. Kyle immediately pulled himself up. He glanced at me and ran falling several times on his way down the hiking trail. I was left there, alone, not knowing what to do. I already accepted death as the quickest solution. The creature jumped and was now on top of me. I choked at the smoke coming from its body and lost consciousness. I was completely out of it when I woke up. I didn't even remember how I got out of the forest. All I knew was I got up and walked for hours. I vaguely remember having crossed paths with some of the villagers at the foot of the mountain. Each one gasped in terror as if they had seen a ghost. I kept walking until a village elder approached me. She was carrying a towel and covered me up. I didn't realize that I was bottomless and bleeding which explained the look on villagers' faces. 
the elder brought me to her house and told me she was an albulario. After giving me clothes, she took a chicken and slit its throat while uttering some words that appeared to be a prayer. Without asking what happened to me, she told me I was attacked by a thick balang, a half-man, half-horse demon. The only way to end this is the next time it comes to you, ride it and pluck the golden hair from its nape. Many police and locals arrived to look for my companions in the forest. I learned from police officers that Alan's pale body was attacked by more leeches, and Kyle was drowned in a shallow creek not far from where I fainted. As I was carried inside an ambulance, the albulario whispered that it wasn't over. The Tikbalang will come back for you and your son. <laughs> Ray was an average guy living in a small town. He was married to a beautiful woman and had two kids, a dog, and a nice house with a pool. Many might say that he lived the American dream. His children were very adventurous, always wanting to spread their wings and travel to different parts of the country. But Ray preferred to stay home, always visited the same places, and kept his social circle small. There was a time when his spirit was as lively as his children's, but that was years ago. Decades of adrenaline rush and adventures that ended in the worst way possible. Many times the memories of that night came back to haunt him, like when journalists knock on his door, asking for an interview. Then the memories would pour back in. Years ago, Ray was not only a fan of adventures, but also of horror. He grew up knowing that he would one day be a famous ghost hunter and reveal the secrets of the dead. However, as time went on, he believed less and less in the afterlife, demons, and mythical creatures. It was all fake to him, and just a big fat check. As Ray watched TV one evening, his phone rang. It was Juan, his best friend, calling from Puerto Rico to congratulate him on his new show's success. Juan was as ambitious as he was. And as soon as Ray answered the phone, he knew his friend would have an enticing proposal. Only three minutes into the call, Juan told him about a monster supposedly roaming the area. The Chupacabras. A monstrous creature that was first seen in Puerto Rico. It attacks livestock at night and consumes their blood, and is also known as a goat sucker. Juan explained that chupacabras were blamed for recent attacks on goats, sheep, and other domestic animals the past month, and had left behind a trail of uneaten carcasses that were completely drained of blood. Ray was instantly interested, and not even a week later, left for Puerto Rico. He spent the vacation days he could have enjoyed with his family on this trip. But this was going to be worth it for his new vlog. After doing research, he found out that the chupacabras were nothing more than wolves or hyenas with rabies, and the paranoia of the villagers only added to the appeal of the legend. After arriving at the airport, Juan greeted him with a huge grin and invited him out to lunch. The two were childhood friends and happily caught up with each other, but they were both clear about their goal. To catch the chupacabras on video. So, without wasting any time, they finished eating, planned a night in the forest, and in the evening got down to business. They knew it was going to be dangerous, so they both brought shotguns to protect themselves from any wild beasts. The first few hours of their night were uneventful, and Juan had fallen asleep. So Ray just went live on Instagram and answered his fans' questions. But then suddenly, Ray felt like the luckiest man in the world and started recording. He heard an animal screaming desperately in pain, and when he looked around, 
He saw it on the ground, butchered. And a shadowy figure was digging into its stomach. Ray was too shocked to scream. Juan woke up from his nap. He began to shoot in the direction of the strange being. Somehow, the creature used the goat as a shield and quickly took off deep into the forest. They both followed it, Ray leading the way. But when they walked towards its direction, Ray saw the hole in the stomach of the poor goat's belly and felt fear for the very first time. What kind of predator would do this? It wasn't even eaten, just ripped into shreds and drained of blood. Ray was taking some photos and recording the poor animal when his battery died. So they stayed quiet and continued looking for the creature. As they walked deeper into the forest, they held onto their weapons for dear life, not knowing where the creature was hiding or when it would attack. Their heartbeat increased as they followed the trail left behind of the corpses of several local animals, all completely drained of blood. The only thing that provided them with a sense of comfort was the sounds of crickets and the koki koki. After following Juan for a while in darkness, all Ray could hear were footsteps in front of him. Ray tried to keep up with Juan, but to no avail because his footsteps were joined by another's. The footsteps were strange. It sounded like a four-legged animal. And then, it started running. Little by little, Ray began to lose track of the footsteps until suddenly it was quiet. And then he heard a creature scream in agony. He knew they weren't far from each other, and he tried to stay positive. He was sure Juan either caught the beast or lost it. Ray walked a little further into the forest only to find Juan, thanks to the glow of the moonlight. He approached him in relief, asking if he lost the goat killer. Juan didn't answer, so Ray asked if he was okay. Suddenly, Juan's body fell backward. As he took a couple of steps towards Juan, he noticed with surprise that his neck had been clawed and screamed so loud that it echoed throughout the forest. <coughs> Suddenly, Ray felt like throwing up and started to feel dizzy. He thought he was going to faint. He ran around in circles yelling for help. While he was processing everything that had happened, he realized that he wasn't alone. He started shooting his gun all around the forest until he heard a growl. Ray's only reaction was to pee his pants when he turned around and watched as the strange being opened the belly of Juan's corpse with its sharp claws and fangs. It was very dark, but he could tell that this being was a little short. It had four legs and long claws. It almost looked like a hairless dog mixed with a reptile. Its red eyes were huge as it stared at Ray. And it kept digging and pulling out all his friend's guts as if it were soil. Ray couldn't control his emotions and let out a scream that was barely heard. Or so he thought, as the creature growled in anger. Ray aimed his gun at the creature and pulled the trigger. He realized he was all out of bullets. It stopped digging, and Ray just froze in fear as it slowly walked towards him. When it was only a few feet away, he could feel his breathing intensify. The creature's eyes were fixated on Ray's neck, which was surely going to be its next target. At that moment, Ray's whole eye flashed before his eyes. He regretted not spending more time with his wife or children. He regretted not being happier. He regretted prioritizing fame over his family. And he regretted being an idiot and not being more prepared. As he wept, the creature stood in front of him. Its face trembled in anticipation, and its claws were ready to pierce his skin. Seeing it up close, he quickly understood that this could not be a wolf with rage. It was a chupacabra. 
With this mythical being in front of him, he could only close his eyes and accept his fate. When suddenly, a loud noise shattered his eardrums. A rifle had been fired in his direction, and after a short war cry from the chupacabra, the creature just vanished from the area. While locals came to assist Ray. When Ray told the story to the world, no one believed him. They all thought he was just trying to get more views and called him an idiot for even going into a forest at night. The footage on his phone wasn't clear enough and the last video he recorded hadn't been saved. He was only approached by journalists or a few young horror enthusiasts who wanted to make the same mistake that ended his friend's life and almost his own. Ray never stepped foot in a forest again and whenever a journalist approached him to ask what happened, he only said that his memories were very blurry and that surely they were only attacked by a big bad wolf. It's been so long since we've come out here to camp. I always forget how creepy the woods get at night. Sebastian murmured to Eliza as he reached over to turn up the heat. It was pitch black, with nothing in front of them for miles except dense trees and snow on the ground. They had left the house late, and now they were going to be setting up their campsite in the dark. The car was full of unspoken tension. Eliza still thought they left late because Sebastian was being really particular about how the car was packed. While he was angry that she hadn't prepped the food the night before, as he suggested. It probably wasn't anyone's fault, but here they were once again, being passive-aggressive and not communicating. Maybe we should just head back, Eliza sighed. It's already darker than we planned, not to mention it wasn't supposed to start snowing for another two weeks. I feel like we might have missed our chance to get a trip in this winter. She kept her eyes on the road, but stole glances at her husband here and there. He just kept scrolling on his phone, not acknowledging her. She didn't like this quiet resentment that sat between them, and she was trying to find the right thing to say to defuse the situation. The whole purpose of this trip was to reconnect, rekindle their relationship that was now in shambles. Or at least that's what their marriage counselor advised them to do. Sebastian let out a deep breath and put away his phone. He kept his eyes forward, staring at the snow as it swirled in front of them, not looking at his wife as he spoke. I guess you're right. Screw it. Let's just go back. They had both hoped that making the call to give up would ease up some of the tension. But unfortunately, it didn't work. It only got worse. Before they could even pull over to turn the car around, something moved in front of their car, making Eliza slam on the brakes and come to a screeching, sliding stop. Silence fell over the car for a moment. Nothing but the sound of Sebastian and Eliza trying to catch their breath, both tingling with a flood of adrenaline running through their bodies. Eliza was the first one to speak. Seb, what the hell was that? By that, she meant the figure that had jumped right in front of the car. It was tall, over six foot, and built like a pro wrestler. And there were definitely arms and a head and two legs there. But it didn't look human. I, uh, I have no idea. Sebastian tried to respond, staring at the thing. The creature was standing only a few feet from their front bumper, obscured by the darkness. It had what looked like ten foot long wings. They arced up higher than its head and swept down elegantly towards the ground. It wasn't moving, and the couple felt like they were somehow suspended in time. Seb call the cops, Eliza said. Sebastian quickly fumbled out his phone and started dialing 911. While Eliza stared at the figure, 
trying to decide what to do next. She reached for her door handle and prepared to get out of the car. What the hell are you doing? He said as the phone rang. I just want to see what it is. Eliza looked dazed as her words dropped away. I mean, maybe it's a statue that the wind blew in. Or a man-sized bird like an eagle? It's not moving. Sebastian opened his mouth to protest, but then the 911 operator answered, and his attention was pulled back to the phone. He began frantically giving the operator a description of their location while trying to make himself sound not completely crazy. He looked around. Yeah, we're on Highway 62. While Sebastian was distracted, Eliza slipped out into the cold night air. The car engine was still running, high beams on, and she had a small utility knife clutched in one hand for a sense of safety. Her breath fogged in the cold air as she took cautious steps towards the thing. It still hadn't moved, and she couldn't make up her mind whether it was a living creature or not. She came to a stop just a few feet away from it and froze, listening to the sound of her own breath. She didn't have the chance to plan her next move, though. The creature was alive. It turned to face her, spreading its wings and raising its face as it moved, shuffling towards her. Its skin was dark and covered in wiry-looking fur but its body was the shape of a large, strong man's. As it extended its wings, Eliza gasped. <gasps> they were broad and looked powerful. She immediately ran back into the car, locked the doors, and sped away. Sebastian hung up the phone. What happened? What is it? He kept asking questions, but Eliza was too focused on the road going a hundred miles per hour. Sebastian looked out the window and was surprised to see the creature chasing them, flying towards the car and ready to swoop down at any moment and attack. Before Sebastian could scream, Eliza cried out, It's Mothman! She remembered all the newspaper articles she stumbled upon on the humanoid. In an instant, Mothman flew down and landed on the road, several feet before them. They were about to crash into the creature with great force, but the creature stopped the car with its hands and didn't even flinch. Eliza slowly looked up at the creature and saw two huge red glowing eyes staring into her soul. It towered over the vehicle and she suddenly felt very small and vulnerable. Finally, it tilted its head, and the creature's blazing red eyes looked into hers. Sebastian had been closing his eyes, anticipating the impact. But when there was none, he opened his eyes. He looked over at Eliza. She wasn't moving. She was just staring at the beast, whatever it was. Neither of them were moving or making a sound. They just stared into each other's eyes, emitting a sense of pure evil. Sebastian scrambled out of the car as quickly as he could, filled with the urgent need to run away. But as soon as he stepped out of the car, Mothman grabbed him, and Eliza followed. He saw her face, and the person standing there didn't look like his Eliza anymore. Her eyes glowed red, the same shade as the monster's. Before Sebastian could react, she charged towards him with a loud shriek. Their little knife was in her hand, and she didn't hesitate to thrust the blade into his neck. He felt the pain of it, but that wasn't as bad as the sound it made. He heard it when the blade tore through his windpipe and then scraped against a bone. He felt like the air had suddenly been sucked out of the world, 
But really, his lungs were just hanging, useless inside his body. He felt a hot spill of blood running down his neck from the wound. And then she stabbed him again. As his body hit the ground, Eliza threw her body over his and kept stabbing. Even after the last bit of breath gurgled out of him. And she did it all under the calm, watchful gaze of the Mothman. All of a sudden, she snapped out of it and heard the loud police sirens approaching. She looked around. Mothman had risen up straight into the sky like a helicopter and flew away. And then she looked down at Sebastian's body, which was ripped apart. She was the monster. Eliza slumped on the ground, exhausted by her manic attack, and realized that her life was now over. She was too shocked to even shed a tear for her husband. No one would believe her story. She had no proof. Mothman was long gone. Yup, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got into this situation. Well, it started when I met Mang Sar during my vacation in Surigao del Sur, located in Mindanao, Philippines. The goal was to visit the Enchanted River, where mermaids, pixies, and fairies supposedly dwelled. But I had no idea I would cross paths with a flesh-eating, terrifying, alien-looking creature. My name is Sheila, and my companion on that trip was Karen. Back in high school, we were both on the varsity swimming and diving team, and had won many national awards. That's when we became close friends and vowed to travel the world together once we finished college. When we arrived in town, we heard a lot of rumors regarding Mang Cesar. The story goes that he had an encounter with a horrifying entity called Shokoi. According to the locals, a Shokoi is a humanoid creature from the Bantai Tubig or Merfolk. It has green scaly skin, tentacles, webbed hands and fins, and legend has it that they live inside the caves near rivers and oceans. Mang Sisar claimed that the Shokoi tried to lure him into mystical caves but he was lucky enough to escape. From that point onwards, he vowed to never swim in the Hinatuan Enchanted River again, and had warned everyone not to go near the area, especially his son. Instead, he advised everyone to go swim in the local cold spring, which was close by. One day, his only child defied him and swam in the Enchanted River at night. The child was never seen again after that. Mang Sisar was seen sobbing by the riverbank, clutching his ten-year-old son's slippers. After that, he was spotted shooing away tourists who wanted to swim in the river, but he was reprimanded by the town officials, who told him to allow the people to enjoy the water. Everyone thought Mang Sisar was a lunatic at the time, and he was treated as an outcast. After all, the Enchanted River was supposed to be a secret place with beautiful creatures guarding the waters, and was also a very popular tourist spot. He still visited the area though, and warned tourists against jumping into the water. That's how we met Mang Sisar. He saw us approaching and immediately ran over to us. The water is too cold for swimming. You can get sick, he said. He also told us about the creature known as the Shukoi and told us that we should go to the nearby resort instead, where we would be safe. Of course, we ignored him and thought he was crazy. We didn't know that doing so would turn out to be a fatal mistake. Being excellent swimmers meant Karen and I always engaged in healthy competition, but it was Karen who consistently won first place, and I came in second. We became the best of friends despite competing in numerous swimming competitions against each other. The Philippines was recommended to us by another swimmer for a summer vacation. The crystal clear sapphire blue waters are what attracted us the most. It was truly breathtaking. The water is clear because someone is taking care of it, Mang Cesar stated. Karen immediately took off her dress and had her swimsuit underneath. Mang Sar got spooked when he saw Karen dive into the water. 
he immediately ran away. We simply laughed and I took off my clothes to jump in. I was in my swimsuit when I suddenly got the feeling of being watched. Karen and I looked around, but didn't see anyone nearby. All we could see was Mong Sar in the far distance still running away from the river. I joined Karen and we decided to have a contest to see who could swim across the river first. Karen laughed. And what will be the prize? She asked. A halo halo, I answered. We swam towards the riverbank, then counted to three. One, two, three. three. The current was strong, but Karen managed to cross the river first. I, on the other hand, struggled and was taken by the current towards a cave. All I remember and saw was a narrow entrance to the cave where the water flowed far away. In the blink of an eye, I saw a blurry shadow of what looked like a big green fish-like creature hop up from underneath the water. It quickly disappeared when Karen swam towards me. Did you see that? I asked Karen. See what? Karen asked as she looked at the direction of where I was pointing. It was also at that moment when I felt I was cramping up, so Karen assisted me in getting out of the water. We rested for a while and had a delicious picnic. We ate chicken barbecue and rice cake wrapped in banana leaves. Karen threw the leaves into the river after she finished. I was shocked. You shouldn't have done that. Karen argued. But it's biodegradable. She remarked and also threw the barbecue stick into the water. After a while, Karen remembered the cave and got curious about it. So she told me that she wanted to go back there. Did you know that no one has ever reached the bottom of the river? Supposedly, there are underwater tunnels that lead down into a subterranean cave system. They've also discovered underwater chambers and more tunnels leading off into uncharted territory. Explorers have only gone down 200 feet, which they think is only scratching the surface. Since I wasn't fully recovered from the cramps, I told her it was dangerous to go there alone. Maybe there were in fact mythical creatures living in the water. But Karen was adamant and dove back into the water and headed straight for the cave. She got closer to the small entrance and that's when I saw her sink as if something pulled her down. I immediately dove into the water. I swam as fast as I could. When I reached the cave, I went underwater. Everything happened so quickly, I lost track of time. The moment I opened my eyes, right in front of me, was the most terrifying being I had ever seen. In front of my face was what I assumed to be the Shokoi Mang Sar had warned us about. It had the head of a fish, but the rest of its body was green and covered with scales. The shape of its body was like a man's, and its teeth were as sharp as blades. I immediately panicked and swam away, trying to put distance between us. But the creature didn't chase me. It didn't even move. When I looked back, I saw it holding Karen, who was now struggling to breathe and escape. I mustered enough courage to swim towards it again, to try and snatch her away from it. But before I could grab Karen, the creature suddenly jerked her arm towards its face and took a massive bite out of her flesh. Her blood mixed with the water of the river. I could taste the saltiness from where I was. Karen managed to slip out of the creature's arms. She swam to the surface to catch her breath. I also took the opportunity to swim up and take another breath. All I could hear was Karen screaming in pain. I was about to swim towards her when the creature resurfaced and bit Karen's neck, killing her in the process. At that point, my fight or flight response kicked in. I was shouting and weeping loudly while trying my best to reach land. Halfway to the riverbank, I felt a tug on my right leg, and a few seconds later, I felt another tug. 
this one more forceful than the previous. I swam faster. At that point, I felt a hand pulling me towards the deep water. Once underwater, I saw the creature dragging and nibbling on my right leg. I felt a sharp pain and the water was filled with my blood. I was getting desperate at this point and was about to give up. I accepted death. Then something hit the water. A big splash. I couldn't comprehend what was happening. When the bubbles cleared, I saw someone else in the water. It was Mang Sesar. He had what looked like a dagger in his hand. He kept stabbing the creature while it gnawed at him. He didn't stop until both of them sank to the bottom of the river. I swam up to the riverbank and got out. Once on dry land, I passed out. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. I was told that Mangse saw a drown trying to save me, and Karen's body was missing supposedly in an attempt to be the first to reach the bottom of the enchanted river, but also rumored to have been devoured by fish or merfolk.